All right, I'm fiddling around with a, a Vietnamese instrument that I bought in Saigon uh, back in 2011. I think it's called a Dan Whip. Maybe saying that wrong. It's a two-string banjo-looking thing that I bought on the streets of Saigon for 20 U.S. dollars. Mostly, I just hang it on my wall because it looks cool. But every now and then, I get it out and play it a little bit and make funny sounds on it. That's about all I figured out how to do so far. All right, so a different introduction for today. So 3.3, what we're going to be looking at is derivative rules, and you'll kind of appreciate this section. After the last section and learning how to use the difference quotient to find uh, derivatives can get a little heavy sometimes. So now we're going to learn lots of shortcuts. All right, so now for the shortcuts. Okay, first of all, I want to let you know that there's generally three ways we write a derivative. We've certainly seen this one, f prime of x, y prime, the prime stands for derivative. I haven't looked at this one as much yet. dy over dx is called Leibniz notation, and it's named after Gottfried Leibniz, who's considered one of the co-inventors of calculus along with Isaac Newton. And they independently developed a lot of calculus ideas at the same time historically. So they're both credited for the beginnings of uh, calculus. So we're going to look at two rules. The first one is the constant function rule. And it just says the derivative of a constant is zero. All right. So if y is a constant function, then that derivative is zero. And really all you have on this is, for instance, if you had f of x equals 2, well, what that is, is, of course, that's a, a horizontal line. And remember what we learned so far is that a derivative is a function that gives you a slope of a tangent line. So if you pick the dot on this function and drew a tangent line, the tangent line would go right alongside that. So that tangent line would have a slope of zero everywhere on this function. So now, no matter where you put a dot, the tangent line runs right, right alongside, so the derivative is zero. So that's a real easy rule. Uh, anytime your, your function is a constant, then the derivative is zero automatically, all right? Okay, next one we have is a power rule, which is really cool. All right, so if you have a function of this form, now it has to be of this form, it's just x to a power. n can be any real number. n can be a fraction, a decimal, whatever. Okay, then what you do is you bring the n down, and then you subtract one from the exponent. So a real quick example of that would be, and I think we probably even looked at this in the last uh, section, like if you have x to the third, the derivative, what you do is a real simple thing. You bring the 3 down, and you subtract one from the exponent, so you would get f prime of x is three, equal to 3x the second. Problem done. If, if we were doing that problem in the difference quotient, we'd probably be working on that for several minutes to get that to work out, okay? So I'm going to do a proof. I'll, I'll do a, a few proofs. I like to do a few mathematical proofs during the semester of different ideas. So uh, what you want to write down on this is, uh, let's just say that our function f of x is equal to c, just where c is a constant. Well, by definition, the derivative is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay, so we're going to use this um, derivative formula <coughs> to figure out, uh, to prove that this derivative is 0. So actually what you do is this. Let's go ahead and get this set up. The proof's real simple on this. Uh, kind of the way I was showing you how to do a difference quotient is like this. So first of all, f of x goes there. f of x on this problem is just c. All right, so that goes there. And then f of x plus h goes here. Well, generally what you do is replace all of the x's in the function with x plus h, but there isn't any x in the function, so it's still c. Okay, it's got to be the same thing, all right? And c is just a constant function, meaning its y value never changes. It never will. So what you end up getting is you just end up getting the limit as h goes to 0 of 0 over h. So that would be the limit of 0 as h goes to 0, and that's 0. So that's a way to prove 
that the limit of a constant, uh, I'm sorry, the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay, now I gotta probably prove the power rule, but you can kinda, you can play around with that difference quotient and uh, require some kind of interesting ideas to prove that, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, what we're gonna look at, just do some examples of derivatives. Okay, f of x equals 10, that is a constant, therefore the derivative is zero. Problem done. g of x equals 3 fourths, that's a constant. Therefore, derivative is zero. You don't have any variables. If you just have a number, that's a constant, okay? Next one's the same way. 2 pi is a constant. It's about, uh, it's about 6.28. If you, if you double pi, you get approximately 6.28. That derivative is zero, okay? Now we'll kind of get into the power rule. So this one, g prime of x, by the power rule, you always have to have x to a power. You bring the five down, write down x, subtract one from the exponent. Most of the time you'll do that in your head. So you get g prime of x is equal to five then. Five, I'm sorry, five x the fourth, okay? All right, so that's it. Derivative of a constant zero. And then you got the power rule. So let's move to the next page. We're going to work a lot more on the power rule. But first, we need to go through and do some uh, a little review of uh, laws of exponents. Okay, these uh, exponent rules you, you've seen like in pre-calc, college algebra. You want to make sure you're totally on top of these things because you'll use them all the time in, in calculus. So... Uh, negative exponents. The idea is, just as an example, if you had like, say, x to the negative 3, that's the same as 1 over x to the third like that. I, I'm going to write something at the side. You don't have to write this down, but just a, a kind of telling you how mathematicians sort of reason this out. So the idea is if you had something like, say, x to the fourth over x to the second, well, that would be x times x times x times x times x over x times x. Well, what happens? Two things cross out, and you get x the second. So it looks like all you have to do is subtract the top exponent minus the bottom to get the answer. And that's what you do. Okay, that's always going to work out that way. But what if you were doing this backwards? What if you were doing x to the two four, uh, x to the second over x to the fourth? Well, if we subtracted the exponents, we would just get x to the 2 minus 4, so we would get x to the negative 2, all right? Well, let's write this out. If we wrote this out, we would have x times x over x times x times x times x. Similar thing would happen. Those go away. So what are you left with? You're left with 1 over x to the second. So that's kind of a train of thought that would show you how that works out, okay? It's got to be that way if you have a negative exponent. It just really means that your x's kind of belong in the bottom, all right, like that. Okay, this is just the opposite situation. So if you had 1 over x to the negative 7, well, that's the same as x to the 7. I'm just kind of doing in reverse what I just did there. So it turns out that any time you change an exponent from one part of the fraction to the other, the sign changes. So if you had like... Uh, say you had x to the third over y to the fourth, that's the same as y to the negative four over x to the negative three. Okay, so you can rearrange exponents, change the sign from negative to positive by doing that. So that's kind of cool. Okay, next thing you're going to see this all the time is square root. So if you were doing the square root of nine, you know that's three, but that's really the same thing as nine to the one half which is equal to 3. Your calculator certainly knows that. If I was to go through and put in square root of 100, well, I know I'm going to get 10, but notice if I go 100 raised to the 1 half power, calculator still knows what we're doing. We're doing a square root. Okay, so fractions as exponents are radicals. Okay, this example just kind of shows you how to do something like this. So if you had, say, the fifth root of x to the fourth power, that can be writ rewritten as x to the four fifths like that. Those are fundamental things that you want to make sure that you have totally down, no problem at all, because you're going to do that all the time when you're working with derivatives. Okay, so down at the bottom, we're going to 
run through a few more examples here. So first of all, remember when you do the power rule, and this is real important, you have to have x to a power. You, you can't have 1 over x to a power, okay? It has to be x to a power. This is the correct way right here. Now, this is a mistake I see here. This really should be d dx of x to the negative 3. Now, that's that Leibniz notation. So d dx just means take the derivative with respect to the variable x. So these things should match up. I had d dx of y. That, you're not going to see it that way. All right, this is a power rule. Okay, so you bring the negative 3 down. You subtract 1 from the exponent. So you get negative 3x to the negative 4 power. Okay, that is your official derivative right there. Now what I like students to do is write the answer with positive exponents or radicals. So I would like a student to go one step further and just write this as negative 3 over x to the 4th power. Both of those answers are correct derivatives. The second version of that's kind of preferred in general. Okay. All right. The next problem, again, has a mistake on it. I was kind of sloppy about the way I did this, I guess, when I typed this up. That should be ddt of 1 over t to the 10th. Those variables got to match up. So we're taking the derivative. The first thing is the power rule has to say variable to a power. So you have to write this like this. This would be ddt of t to the negative 10. Then you can do your derivative. You're not ready to do your derivative until it looks like that. So I can't stress that enough, okay? So this goes like this. Now do the power rule. Negative 10, t to the negative 10 minus 1. You can do that in your head. That's negative 10, t to the negative 11. Or you can write that preferably as negative 10 over t to the 11th. Students a lot of time ask the question, why didn't I move the negative 10? Well, why do you think? Negative 10 is not an exponent. Negative 10 is a number. Students do this from time to time. It's not true that negative 10 is just 1 over 10. All right, those are totally different numbers. Okay, so you can't do that. They're not exponents, right? Okay, so Next thing I want to kind of look at is just work a little bit on radicals, give you a couple examples. Again, it has to be x to a power, a variable to a power, so you're not ready to the, do the derivative. You have to write that as x to the one-half first. Now do the derivative. Now you can do the power rule. So we'll say y prime, bring down the one-half, x to the one-half minus one, now learn to do it this way. You're, you're subtracting one, so do two halves. Because two halves is one, and the denominators match up. You always want these denominators to match up, see? If this was a one-third, you would use three-thirds. All right, so what we have is we have one-half x to the negative one-half. That's a correct derivative. My preference is you go ahead and make the exponent positive by doing that and then moving one step for, forward and just changing the x to the one-half back to this. So those are all three correct answers. The last one is the preferred one. If you start off with a radical, you probably want to write your answer with a radical. That's just kind of a general rule of thumb. Okay, well, let's take a look at this one. So again, general rule of thumb, change your radicals to exponents. So how do you write this as an exponent? x to the two-thirds. Now, you can't do the derivative until you make it look like this. So you have to say x to the negative two-thirds. So you're doing just kind of the basic properties I reviewed from algebra, and now we're ready to do the calculus. Okay, so the calculus begins here. Power rule. Bring down the negative two-thirds. Subtract one from the exponent. So what are you going to use? Three-thirds. Good. Okay, so we got negative two-thirds x to the negative 5 thirds would be an appropriate correct derivative. But again, I want you to do two things. I want you to make the negative exponent positive. So that's another correct answer. Finally, what I want you to do is the best answer would be negative 2 over 3. Oh, hold on, I need to change it back to a radical. I already did that. 
Okay, so let's see, finish this up. Here's what we'd have. We'd write this as negative two over the third root of x to the fifth. Okay, so you gotta know how that goes. The third root, always that denominator is what the root is. The exponent is just still the exponent. Okay, so it goes like that. Okay, this last problem on this page, a lot of times students aren't paying attention on this problem. A lot of times students wanna go, Ah, oh, this looks like a power rule. So I just go 2 pi to the 2 minus 1, therefore I get 2 pi. No way. This is not a variable. This is a constant, okay? Pi is just a number. Pi is not a variable. So if you did pi to the second power, well, you get this. You get a number, okay? So what is the derivative of a constant? Zero. Be careful about that, okay? I like to test over problems a lot like that just to make sure students are thinking correctly, okay? All right, so that kind of demonstrates some different ways you do the power rule. So we're going to go to the next page, and on this next page, I'm going to put you to work and let you do a round of problems here. So go ahead and pause the video and see how many of these you get right. Hopefully you get them all right. Okay, so moment of truth. Let's see how we did. Okay, the first two are constants, so their derivative is zero. All right, two pi is a constant, derivative is zero. So is e, okay, if you put 5e e to the fourth, shame on you. Okay, you need to learn from that. e is not a constant. What is e anyway? Sometimes students don't have that great of a background for that. But uh, like if I go second division symbol, that's a constant. And you learn about that in logarithms and so forth. So E is not a variable. Anytime you see that, that is going to stand for the very well-known constant. Okay. There's kind of an interesting side note on this. Um, this is my favorite equation in the whole world. That's called the Euler equation. To me, it's the equation of God. It's like the math God there staring us right in the face. The reason mathematicians like this so much is it's got... A e and a pi in it, which are the two most famous constants. Zero and one are the basis of all computers. That's kind of basic binary digits there. Equal sign, plus sign, and even the imaginary unit in there. That is like an amazing equation. It's very godlike. All right, so here's the next thing you should have got. Uh, three, let's see, that would be 12x to the 11th. That's pretty standard. This one again, standard power rule, bring down the one fourth, subtract one from the exponent, you get this, and then just change that exponent to positive. Uh, if your problem starts off with exponents, generally I want you to just make sure your answer has positive exponents. Okay, number five, negative five over x to the sixth. You start by bringing the x to the negative five to the top so that you can do the power rule then negative 5x to the negative 5 minus 1 gives this, and then change that to a positive exponent. Don't move the negative 5. Okay, the rest of these I think are radicals. I made a mistake on this. This really should be ddt cube root of t, or I could have written it as ddx cube root of x. So if you have the same answer I have with an x in it, that's okay. So again, what I do is I change this to t to the one-third. A third root is the same third thing as a one-third power. Bring the one-third down, subtract one from the exponent. That again is why I'm using three-thirds. So you get this, change that to a positive exponent, and then change that back to a radical. So that's the answer on that. Okay, and the last problems here are these. So I should have got this answer on seven, this answer on eight. Again, notice what I did. I changed that to z to the 5, 6, and then power rule. Knock off the 5, 6, subtract 1 from the exponent. That gives this, make the exponent positive, change the ex uh, rational exponent back to a square, uh, not a square root, a sixth root. So that's technically the sixth root of z to the first. Okay, like that. Okay. And the next one, two things you got to do before you do the derivative. Change the square root to x to 1 half. Move it up the top so that you can do the power rule. Knock off the negative one half, subtract one from the exponent. That's what you always do. Knock off the exponent, subtract one from it. Right? And uh, that's the result I got on that. 
Okay, number nine, derivative zero. Why? Because it's a constant. I wanted you to graph this just to remind you of why, because you're going to forget rules. And uh, if you forget rules, you want to have methodology for figure, figuring stuff out. So basically what happens, this is a horizontal line. So any point on this function will have a tangent line that will have a slope of zero. So that's how that works out. Okay, so that should get us off to a pretty good start on the basic rules. And we're going to run through uh, a few other things on this, just graphing derivatives. I'm going to do a couple more examples and then close off this as part one of the video. I'm going to do this video in, in pieces. Okay, so um, we looked in the last section a lot about how you graph derivatives. So um, in this, these are just a couple of examples of graphs and their derivatives. Uh, this, is, this here would be the function, f of x. And then uh, the red part right here, that would be f prime of x. So one of the things we learned how to do in the last section was, well, the derivative is 0 wherever there's a horizontal tangent line. So the graph of the derivative would have, would be, have that y value of 0. The other place is here. So again, the value of the derivative is 0. And then we kind of learned this. Well, it looks like we have positive derivatives here. So that means that the graph of that derivative is positive values, okay, all the way through there then. Then what happens is you start getting into these negative derivatives. The line starts sloping downward, so when you have negative derivatives, that means that the, the, the values of the derivative are below the y-axis on the graph of the derivative. Then we have, going back to a positive slope here on this graph, just means that the derivative is going to have positive values. So you want to kind of be able to reason out roughly what a graph of a derivative looks like. Okay, now this time what we're going to do, we're going to do just a little activity with, I'm going to do one example and let you do one. And uh, so first of all on this one, now that we know the shortcuts, uh, let's go ahead and you can do this on graphing calculator if you want to. You don't really need a, probably a graphing calculator to do these problems because they're fairly simple. Um, but uh, let's just go ahead and graph x to the second. Let's do a standard window. So zoom six. And of course, you know there's parabola, hopefully. You can go to your table of values if you like, and let's just plot several good points on this. So let's see, we have negative three, nine, and you can do this in your head. Uh, negative three to the second is nine. You have negative two, four. Negative two to the second is four. Negative one, one. 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and 3, 9. Just so that we have an accurate graph, that will be this, and then go ahead and just label that as f of x. Okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the derivative. Okay? We now know how to do the derivative with the power rule. So that is just 2x to the 2 minus 1. Therefore, the first derivative is... 2x. Okay? And let's just graph that on the calculator too. Right? Even though that's a line and you can do that pretty easily in your head. So we go through and do that. That's the graph of the derivative. So a couple of things happen on this. Remember this would have a, you know, what this is really y equals 2x plus 0. So it has a y-intercept of 0. It has a slope of 2 over 1. So you could just go up 2 over 1 up 2 over 1, and so forth. Okay, then you want to go ahead and just sketch that out like this then. So the purpose of this problem is just to see if what we learned about graphing derivatives, if this makes sense to you, what we learned. So here's kind of the key things. The, the, the derivative is 0 at 0. So we would expect the graph of the derivative to cross the x-axis right there. And then the other things that we learned are this. Right now, we have a negative derivative. Okay, so what do we have? We have negative derivative values there. Okay, and then what happens is we start getting positive derivative values because the slope of the tangent line is positive. So we start having positive derivative values like that. So when you do these graphs of a function and its derivative, they need to make sense to you. 
okay? Okay, so what I'm going to have you do is just kind of repeat what I did on this problem. It's almost the same thing. Use your calculator to help you make an accurate graph of x to the third, find the derivative, and then graph the derivative. You're welcome to use your calculator to do these graphs, but get a, an accurate graph. That's important. Okay, so this is what you should have done. I just wanted you to graph a cubic function. So you got that. And I want you to notice the derivative of this cubic function is quadratic. So you end up with a parabola. That's kind of how polynomials tend to work like that. And uh, just kind of as a reminder here, <coughs> you have negative derivatives here. So your values of your derivative are below the x-axis. You have a zero derivative there. So, of course, the red graph ha is, has a point zero, zero. Have positive derivatives here. Oh, hold on. I'm looking at that backwards. Sorry about that. I'm just totally doing this backwards crap. Okay, so we're looking at the blue graph. Okay, the blue graph. It has um, a positive derivative here because the tangent line is sloping up. Okay, P positive tangent line. Therefore, the derivatives have positive values. Okay, and then over here, same thing happens. Still have a positive derivative. And that derivative gets bigger. See, the slope of the tangent line gets steeper. Right now, the tangent line maybe is 1. Right now, maybe the ta tangent line is 10 or something like that. So that's why the graph does what it does. <coughs> so your derivative is 3x to the second. All right, that'll wrap that up. And work on your shortcuts. You want to get to where you can do those fast and efficiently and correctly, of course. Good luck.